Uh, we're going to talk through a few slides here, a little bit about actually building the compost pile. Uh, and I want to thank Cornell. Cornell generously offered a couple of uh, diagrams. So when you see the uh, cartoon type diagrams in these, Cornell provided those for us. Um, so when we build this compost pile, we're going to want to lay that carcass on its side in there. Uh, you want to get it on its side, not sitting up. And we're going to want about 18 to 24 inches of a coarse carbon material there on the base. And like Jessica said, this is an aeration process. We are not making silage here. We actually need oxygen in there. So it's going to work aerobically. If we provide that uh, large coarse carbon base, something that's going to provide some space in there, it kind of will operate a little like the flu in the chimney and provide some oxygen in there to uh, allow this process to take place. Um, and then we're going to want to have some the margins around that carcass covered 18 to 24 inches as well. If we have small carcasses, baby calves, young pigs, uh, some goats, we went to a goat operation in Montana that uh, composted uh, its mortalities. Uh, you can get mobile animals in there, uh, lay them on the site again. Um, and like before, you're going to want 18 to 24 inches of carbon, large carbon material underneath there, uh, and make sure you get 18 to 24 inches surrounding that carcass. You know, and just to show you, you don't have to have a huge compost pile to get rid of a cow. You know, we're going to show you some more pictures, but a lot of places, you know, if a ranch wants to compost and they don't have a lot of losses, you know, they don't want necessarily have the large footprint that windrows would take. You can use some bales or concrete uh, uh, barricades to build a uh, what's called a bin compost and be able to get rid of those animals that way. So that coarse base material aids in passive aeration, as I said. If you got good oxygen in there, uh, it should take three to six months to break down one of these carcasses. Uh, you may still have you know, a hip bone or jaw bone or something. So a lot of places will sift those out or else let it uh, go a little bit longer. Uh, but for that first three to six months, you need that coarse material in there to get the oxygen in. Material around the carcass can be a finer material. It doesn't need to have as much uh, breathing room there. Um, a lot of places will use other composts they've already created. They might use waste silage or some manure solids to get that going and keep that microbial activity working. Uh, the cap over the top of it, you want something that's pretty non-odorous, that's not going to emit a lot of odor out of it, uh, and it acts as insulation, it acts as a biofilter. Uh, as this uh, animal breaks down, you may have the cap drop a little, you may have to add a little bit more on there uh, to keep that going. And we always get the question when we do these, does this provide odor, does this stink? You know, and we traveled from basically four miles within the Mexican border to 20 miles within the Montana border checking out compost piles. And it's amazing how little odor there is created. It's amazing how few flies there are around it. It really surprised me as we got into this. Um, inside there, around that uh, carcass, we want to have about 50 to 60 percent moisture there in that first three to six months to keep that activity going. Uh, if we have warm material, so it, something that's not frozen, if you're in Haver, Montana, starting one of these, uh, that cold material is going to be harder to get that activity going. So if you can use some warmer uh, carbon sources, uh, warmer material to around that carcass. Also, if you can, if you lose that cow or you lose that you, and in that cold environment, if you can get this compost pile together quicker after that death, rather than waiting a week, it's going to be, start the process and compost a little quicker for you. But even with freezing temperatures, uh, compost will happen. Uh, folks in Montana, when they did theirs, they had uh, temperature probes in there, and I believe maybe Tommy has some temperature slides in his. It's pretty amazing how this works even in cold climates. Um, 
Maybe I have the temperature slice. So even with freezing and ambient temperatures, this compost in Haver, Montana, uh, I believe it was below zero temperatures up there, and they were had 140 degrees inside this compost pile. And I believe this one you guys started in uh, February that year, correct? Right, there was cabin time mortality. So even in those cold extreme temperatures, this stuff does work. So there are several carbon options we've listed here. A lot of the common ones that people use, wood chips, sawdust, straw. A lot of people use some waste silage uh, from around the silage pile. Uh, manure solids. Uh, some people use corn stalks or some crop processing waste. And inside the book, when you guys get the book, we have a full table of other options that talks about some of these materials and what the good and the bad points of using them might be. So, as we already said, materials with a moisture of 50 to 60 percent are going to help keep that microbial action working better. Uh, and you want to maintain this process for several weeks without irrigating. You can, if it's not wet enough, you can add some water into this to uh, get that activity, but you don't want to get too wet. If you get too wet, you're going to uh, reduce that microbial activity. Uh, you need an adequate base, and the cover will prevent leaching of the carcass moisture and odors. It does a really good job if you get a good cap on there. And low odor, if you can keep that odor down, it helps out with neighbors. You know, and we see this as an opportunity. We talk about ranches, feedlots, large dairies. But, you know, when we look at these bin composts, this is an opportunity for small operations as well. You know, you get 10 miles away from here and we get into the Green Acres environment and everybody's got three goats and a horse. This might be an opportunity if they, if they lose the kids' uh, 4-H pony when the kid's in college for the 11th year. Um, this might be the opportunity for them to be able to set up a bin compost and be able to dispose of that there rather than paying three or four hundred dollars to send it to landfill. <clears throat> and if that's the case, you want to make sure you have a good cap so you can keep those odors down, keep the neighbors happy, keep the scavengers away. So, like I said earlier, we can have windrows on a large operation or we can have bin composting. When we look at windrows, they have a very large footprint. You know, some of our feedlots and some of our large dairies are doing this and they'll have three or four acres to be able to lay out their windrows on. Um, it requires quite a bit of a carbon source and a base for covering. But if you have those large operations, it's probably the way to go. And I will tell you here in Colorado, when we started working on this, part of the reason that I agreed to get involved with this team when uh, Jessica approached me was that I was in the process of working with the Department of Ag and the Department of Emergency Management here to rewrite our emergency plans for feedlots. Because just in the county I live in, we have about 400,000 head of feedlot cattle uh, in that county alone. So we were rewriting plans on what we were gonna do if we had a foot and mouth incident. So after we got into the composting and we started showing the original drafts of this manual to some of our emergency manager people, that's what they're thinking about if they get an emergency beyond about 20 head. They're going to look at composting here in Colorado as a possible solution to deal with health emergencies uh, and using the windrow aspect. Now if we have a bin, it reduces that footprint quite a bit and we can, we can conserve the amount of carbon source that we're utilizing. Uh, even if, if we have a cow or a horse, we can be able to utilize this. So how much material are you going to need? If you figure this on like a per steer basis, uh, estimates to start that off with, uh, for a grown cow, a 13, 1400 pound steer, we're looking at about 12 cubic yards, maybe down to seven and a half cubic yards for a smaller animal. But uh, to get that animal covered up, and if you're doing a windrow process, you know you're just going to, once you got the first one started, you're just going to tack on to it and bring out a line. Practically speaking, our mature cow 
she's going to need about nine foot width and ten foot of length to be able to cover up the average cow uh, with this much uh, material over top of her. If we have small animals, baby calves, pigs, you have a goat operation, we can layer those mortalities in there. Hopefully you don't have enough that you have to layer, but if you do, we can layer those in there. You still want to maintain 18 to 24 inch margins on the outside, top, underneath, but that layer in between them, we can uh, get away with 8 to 12 inches of material in between them. And remember, that's going to have to be coarse enough in that material in the middle that the oxygen coming in here still gets up here. So you want to use some coarse material there. If you're building bins, uh, as I said earlier, a lot of people use the big square hay bales. And you've already seen a couple pictures of those. If you watch the video, if you grab the book, you'll see some more pictures of bale hay bins. Uh, some people use the concrete barriers like they have out on the highway. And then some will do wooden structures. When you're building these, one of the nice things about hay bales, the big eight foot long hay bales, it's a real good size to be able to get your loader in between there and stir this up at six months when you've got to move it. Um, if you've got a bin, they're easy to block off so you can keep scavengers out of there a lot easier. And remember, when you're putting in these bales, you've got to have that aeration. There's got to be a little bit of space for some oxygen to get in there. As you're designing these, whether you're looking at a windrow system or whether you're looking at a bin system, NRCS has done a really nice job. Uh, they've got a, a manual that facilities construction and engineering, uh, practice standard 316 if you're looking for it online somewhere. And it has some information in there that will really help you in designing your bin systems or your windrows. And I am going to turn this over to Tommy.